back in the fur shed. This is Trapping Today. I'm Jeremiah Wood. Great to be here as always. And in tonight's episode, we're going to have a good one. We're joined by Kyle Kotz from Kotz Brothers Lures. And Kyle's going to give us an overview of his thoughts on the fur market. We talk about how the market is changing how it has changed and how it will probably continue to change, how that affects us as trappers. So we'll get into it. First, a couple of notes. I want to thank our sponsors, Kotz Brothers Lures, of course, K-A-A-T-Z-B-R-O-S.com. That's where you go to get your trapping supplies. Be sure to sign up for the newsletter because in the next coming months, Kyle is going to have some exciting uh, deals and also uh, one really interesting new product that I think some of you guys are going to like. And stay tuned for that. If you're on the newsletter, you will get email updates with that information. On X, use On X Hunt app on your phone. Turn your phone into a GPS. Use it on the trap line. Use it while you're out hunting, fishing, farming like I do. You can mark all your trap locations. You can run tracks, figure out where you went. Make sure you get back on the right roads. You can scout using the latest aerial imagery. Um, and you can also get landowner information, get layers like uh, forest fires out west. You can figure out where areas that have recently burned. You can look at crops, different uh, crop plantings in different years. There's all kinds of data with that, and it's a very simple, easy subscription. You go to onxmaps.com. Use the code TRAP if it's your first time there. You're going to get 20% off just by using that code when you check out. On X, it is the ultimate resource for mapping um, for whatever you're doing outdoors. And finally, a reminder that we have a sale going on in the Trapping Today store, trappingtodaystore.com. And all Trapping Today t-shirts are $10 off, so they're $15 free shipping. $15 shipped to your door, but a lot of the sizes are sold out, so you need to go check them out. Uh, There's Mustella t-shirt in two different colors. Most of the regular sizes are sold out. You might find one in your size though. And uh, there's some a few more sizes available in the um, in the blue Trapping Today logo shirt. So check those out. Get your Birch River Beaver Lure, whatever other products uh, that you need. Maybe a little bit of swag, maybe a little bit of lure to prep uh, for the season. Check it all out at trappingtodaystore.com. I'm, I'm trying to plug that a little bit because this time of year things start to slow down and the Shopify store fees do not slow down they stick uh they stick it right to you so even if you're not selling any items you got to pay the fee so uh we sell a little bit in the summer just to kind of keep things going and then when trapping season comes around uh it it makes up for it so all right guys we're going to get into this conversation with kyle Cotts from Cotts brothers lures kyle Cott, good to have you back yeah good to be back so you want to talk about the fur market we have just uh finished up the uh, the first fur harvesters auction of the year which it's always seemed odd to me that we had to wait you know we have to wait till months after a lot of trapping seasons are already closed to get an idea of what the auction prices are going to be um but but it, i think everything's kind of been kind of played out um for the season and, and it's kind of all all of the private buying and all the auction buying that recently took place has kind of set the tone for where the industry's at so i'd love to now that we're here, I'd love to get your your thoughts overall on the fur market. Yeah, so I, I guess overall, you know, it's it's tough to really analyze the fur market based off of, off of one sale. Um, there's you know, fur harvesters only is handling a certain percentage of the fur that's actually available on the market. So there's a lot of factors and things that it's really hard to to pinpoint and say, this is where we're at. So in just looking at fur harvesters numbers, I would say overall positive. Um, one of the more positive sales I think they've had in recent times, um, pretty good clearances on a lot of items. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned it in your little recap video too, like, like it was good to see the, uh, like what I call the secondary species, like otter, badger, skunk, they did very well. Um, and, and I think that's a little bit of a testament to, you know, fur harvesters has a pretty strong, like novelty base buyer base there. Um, but I, I was kind of shocked, like as well as skunks did. Um, and I think that's probably, uh, I was told that that was, they're making a certain type of hat with tails from the skunks. So that kind of forms a little bit of a niche market 
drives that sale. I, I think that was one of the one of the zoo animals, as we call them, that really stood out as being super good on the sale. Yeah, skunks. for folks that haven't seen the averages, they were 950 skunks sold for $23.21 on average. Yeah, that's that's pretty 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 strong, you know. And again, will that stay that way? I would lean towards probably not. Um, it, it probably, hopefully, it will be good come May. But at some point, you know, is that a uh, is that a fashion trend driving that? Uh, I I doubt it. I, I I think it's probably a little bit of a niche thing. Although I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> I'd love to see a see a strong skunk market because that would translate to guys uh, probably having trappers having more interest in producing skunks and skunk in, put more essence on on the market. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, I, the the other thing we kind of text about too is you, you know the. The beaver we talked about last fall. Beaver are kind of the new coyotes. Um, you know, how long does that last? You know, we never really know. But I, I think the beaver market is the one item that is definitely standing out as being a strong, strong item. Yeah, this was interesting. It's the first time that I can remember that fur harvesters actually broke out all of the different sizes and grades in their uh, sale results page. So the- yeah, yeah, and and that's that's something too. Um, and again, I don't mean to knock fur harvesters, but sometimes the auction results and NAFA was famous for doing this too. They list things in a certain way that look positive. <laughs> exactly. And I don't feel fur harvesters needed to do that with the beavers. So it was pretty. I, I feel like they were very transparent and very fast. Uh, like we had talked via text that they were really fast oh, yeah. in getting the information posted to their website, which I thought was really cool. I mean, they, no doubt they're really busy and, and people are probably stretched thin when they're in the midst of a sale, but they really got the information out quick, which I, I thought was really cool. Well, yeah, trappers have been complaining about that for a long time because of where we're at mm-hmm. with technology. It's like, why can't we see what's happening real time? Why do we have to wait three days to get a report? And so they, they really stepped it up this time around. I thought, you know, you could watch the entire auction was live streamed on YouTube. You could watch the whole thing. And then, Every evening after the auction completed, they had a, a printout of, of results for that day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I thought that was really cool. I, I didn't actually listen to any of the sale. I, it was kind of hectic days for me doing it with some different projects. And, and so I didn't listen like I, I generally tend to. And so I missed most of it. But I did. Uh, I kind of scrolled through the, the buyer catalog and, and was keeping track. And it was cool to be able to sit down and like, bang, here's the whole rundown for the day without having to like try to scroll back through YouTube and listen right. to bits and pieces. Uh, I think that was, I, I think, uh, you know, that was for her. It's just need to be complimented on, on how, how they handled everything in that regard. I think they did a great job. Um, the one thing, uh, the one item that definitely seems to stand out as being a poor item is muskrats. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's something to give a little bit of nuance. Um, we've talked about it before, too, that, you know, the, the hammer price on, on a muskrat, if, if it sells for $3 on the, on the sale, that is not the price the buyer pays, nor is it the price the seller receives. Um, you know, the trappers are familiar with they're going to pay a commission, um, there's also a buyer buyer fee on that price, and with muskrats, it's about a dollar twenty five. So if you look at a three dollar muskrat and you add a dollar twenty five to it, you know you're you're putting that muskrat then at four dollars and twenty five cents, which is a significant jump, um, almost Relative adding fifty yeah. percent. You're you know forty percent to the price. You know, when muskrats were selling for ten dollars, and you put a dollar twenty-five fee on it, it's only twelve and a half percent more. So, for a buyer to go there and buy and pay a twelve and a half percent premium, you know, they can they can absorb that, probably bid a little bit less, and stay within the valuation, get the muskrats bought. Well, under the current muskrat market, it's really a tricky situation, and it's not that muskrats are unsellable. It's just in order for fur harvesters to make money. I, t- I don't fault them. They they need to charge that fee, but then from the the buyers looking at that saying, well, we'll just buy them elsewhere because we can't pay that much more for them. 
Um, so I think that is it plays a big part in the reason they have a backlog of muskrats there. Yeah. And that is something that probably, you know, it's 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 also one of them things that that people forget too. The longer fur sits in storage, it's it's not fresh. Um and then it gets to a point where uh buyers probably are gonna be be hesitant to buy something that sat in storage storage because they're not sure how it's going to dress. And that I think becomes a bit of a problem because you know a buyer, a buyer doesn't want to take unnecessary risk. And and what's to say you're going to have, especially muskrats as greasy as they are, um, grease burn, and you're going to when you dress those muskrats, what percentage of them are going to be damaged or so or slip some uh, to where it's going to take a manufacturer a lot more labor to make that skin into something that they can just lay on the table to start to use versus a fresh good that or something that they buy dressed already that they know exactly what they're getting. Um, so maybe we're going too, too deep into the woods here, but I, there's a lot of factors, I think, that affect the muskrat at auction market when we're at a price that is uh, makes that fee a big challenge for the buyer. Yeah, and so I, the, I just the ones think... that sold were average $2.14, and there were only 31% of them sold. They were the lower quality rats. Um, yeah, one of, yeah. One of the things, in my opinion, I, I felt that the minimum values that fur harvesters had on those rats seemed a little bit unreasonable to me. You know, yes. they, they were, mm-hmm. you know, five five dollars for a lot of the better rats as a minimum and it just so if if they didn't meet those minimums they just held on to them and no sailed them but it seems like they were holding Mm -hmm. out for a little too much in my opinion yeah and that's that's the thing that really it that makes it tough selling on an auction and i i can go back to you know to back up and and really look at a broad scope i'm not in any means comparing fur harvesters to nafa um, but just strictly speaking from the standpoint of a fur auction, if we look back at like 2013, 2014, we were coming off of like, a, I hate to use the word boom, but we were coming off of a pretty strong high market. And I remember at NAFA specifically listening to Ranch Fox. I can't remember the exact numbers, but um, they had valuations. Let's say they had a Ranch Fox valued at $200. And I can remember buyers saying 175, like you could hear them on the on the stream, yeah. and they'd say no, that's too low, and they didn't take it. And I, and it was ranch reds because the red fox market, ranch reds, wild reds was really hot, and they they wouldn't take those bids. And then three or four years later, they they sold those same fox for like fifty and sixty dollars yeah. after storing them after. And you could have taken 175 and got a move, and then you waited four years and took $50. And not to come off as being a jerk, but it's like when you do that, it is a, a recipe for failure. Um, and, and I think not to say that's the only reason, but that factors into what happened at NAFA. There was – you get too greedy and it can affect business and and then it also for it also affects the trapper it affects the rancher it's a trickle down effect and so that those kinds of decisions there's hundreds of them that led to nafa's collapse and i think now and it's through no fault of their own but uh, it wasn't that long ago. It's only been five years that all that happened. So now I think we have hesitancy from some people to ship their fur to fur harvesters because they got burned at NAFA. And that's not fair to fur harvesters, but I also understand the hesitancy. Um, and, and I think the valuations is something that is really, really tricky because Fur harvesters, if you have that valuation too high and then you are forced to liquidate them muskrats, you know, I am not opposed to liquidation. Sometimes that has to happen to kind of reset the market and it has to happen just as a general business practice. But I'd like to to hope that 
if we see liquidation coming, we do it now, not wait. Yeah. Because the longer you wait, the longer it prolongs the recovery. Well, and, and so that I makes me nervous with the muskrats, I guess, is where I'm going with that. And it's, it's worse in a falling market, especially because you're losing value on those items. But I think the challenge mm-hmm. that, that someone like for Harvesters is in is, is their middleman. So they're representing the seller. And you have a lot of sellers, a lot of shippers that think their fur is worth maybe more, a little more than it is because of what the market was a couple of years ago or what, you know, what they got, mm-hmm. what they got this last time that they sold. And so um, y- you can't put the blame completely on them because if they, if they fire sale a bunch of stuff, people are going to get mad. But I agree with exactly. you. Exactly. If you have a real market, not saying you got one buyer there trying to lowball everybody, but if you have a competitive market with multiple buyers, with speculators, with people in the industry, you should an auction should set the proper price or what that fur is worth at that given time, and uh, if right. that's the price, that's mm-hmm. the price. Yeah, and and I think you know one of the things that that uh, to compare the two two. The, the differences fur harvesters does not have the private treaty dealer lots like NAFA used to have. I mean, they had, you know, back, back in the day, if, if NAFA had how X amount of coon, they a lot of times had three times that volume in dealer full lots that were had minimums and they weren't on the auction block. They could be bought during, after any time of year that dealers would send up there saying, hey, I've got, I can't remember the details exactly. I think you had to have a thousand skins, all the same grade and size, and they would make a full dealer lot. And then the dealer got to say, I will take $30 for those. And NAFA held them and sold them for $30. Um, and, And I think that when we look back to our last peak, like in 13, you know, that drew probably a lot of huge buyers to NAFA um, because they knew they could get outside of the auction. They knew they could buy quantities at a certain price. And it was kind of NAFA lacked some transparency because, you know, the average trapper that shipped for, they didn't know that you know, you're only looking at the auction results that NAFA would publish. And in them auction results, there was really no data from the private treaty uh, business that happened or the quantities. So it was really hard to really know what was happening. And and I also remember dealers being upset because, let's say, for instance, an item sold on the auction for a $20 average, and that dealer had those same skins – private treaty for 15 NAFA would still sell them for 15 so you had people that would go to the sale and then buy afterwards and buy stuff cheaper than what the auction had been so you had dealers kind of I I can remember like I didn't know any of this was going on until I you know I had a a friend of mine I again this is probably 15 20 years ago I had some I don't remember what it even was but I was excited and he's like yeah we took a beating and he's like, we were at a convention. He's like, yeah, NAF was buying us a steak dinner too because <laughs> I lost <laughs> big bucks because they sold my private treaty stuff less than what the trapper did. So with that being said, there's a lot of those dealers that, you know, country buyers, the grassroots kind of for country fur buyers in our country that were doing that and selling to NAFA. And those dealers, a lot of them, are either out of business because of what happened with NAFA or they are now selling to larger country buyers like the Grenwalds in the in the country because they know it's a guaranteed check. And so when we when we when we look at what um the fur harvester sale was like, it doesn't totally give the full picture of the market. It gives us a good idea but it doesn't tell the whole story. Whereas maybe 20 years ago, some of those NAFA sales, they still didn't tell the whole story, but they told more of it because of the sheer volume of, of business that was happening in conjunction with them sales. Yeah. Um, and not just, uh, not just sheer volume in, you know, back with the, both the, the ranch and wild for market back then, but, 
I'm just looking at simply wild fur right now. There, these volumes are nowhere near what we used to sell. I mean, so no, no. so that's another another point where this is a picture of where the market's at, but they only moved twelve thousand raccoon. Right, and and that's and and again, that's no fault of fur harvesters. We're at extreme low production. Um, now, is it is it as low as it seems? You know, I know we have customers that trap coon this year and last year over the past five years. I know there's a lot of stuff that kind of gets stockpiled. Now, I also feel like there's probably not a huge amount of buyers speculating on fur these days. So I I would like to think a lot of the fur is getting put on the market reasonably quick. Um, yeah. I, I just don't know how much is being held back. And there's no way of knowing. It, it's it's always a guess. But um, uh, it's it's – it's really tough to to analyze that twelve thousand figure um, because we don't we don't know about the variables um, we don't know about how much of the production is actually getting to the market quickly but the one thing I can say with 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 even guessing on the extremes we're still at an extreme extreme low production yeah. and uh, that's that's something that's really really tough like especially with the coon and then you know i thought that it was positive for the coon but and i feel the coon market is probably better a little bit better sure. but still if we look at across the harvest region taking you know where coon are produced uh from georgia to texas upwards to missouri southern illinois across kentucky into the mid-atlantic states that area of the country that has more of a coat type coon a lot of those coon are still basically unsellable. Yeah, um, a lot of them aren't, so, even being, aren't even being skinned. Yeah, yeah. So when we take that into effect and we look at the at the averages and what's being sold, a lot of those coon that are being sold are are semi heavy, better. Like we're we're selling the very best. Yes, we're not absolutely. even. You know, the 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 lower end coon are not coming on the People market. People have and learned I mean, to high grade. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I can, I can think back to like in 07, 08, when I trapped Alabama, I was selling Alabama coon for 15 and $20. Wow. Now you can't hardly sell a good uh, Northern Illinois, Iowa, Southern Minnesota coon for that. So it's, it's really tough. I, I still, like I said, I, I felt the Fort Harvester's coon results were positive and favorable, um, something to build upon, but we still got a long, long ways to go. And also production production is another, a big problem, um, that we potentially have. Um, and I, I kind of, I, I maybe talked about it. We talked about it too, about like supply and demand. I, it, you know, I believe in it. Uh, that it has a fact, uh, it, 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 it has a place. But I also sometimes think supply and de- demand is like the chicken and the egg. Uh, it doesn't factor in inflation or speculation. And so if we look at those things, again, I don't know how much speculating is going on, but the good, if there is goods being bought by, uh, with specu- if, if a buyer is speculating, those skins have to re-enter the market at some point. And when that happens, it's going to potentially look like, oh, production's come up. But if it's coon that were bought two years ago and they re-entered the market, production supply has not really changed. It's just been prolonged a little bit. Yeah. And so it's really hard to know. Um, and, and then the bottom line of, of, in all of it to me is, High fashion is very fickle, so demand can change really fast. Uh, it, I mean, just look at coyotes with Canada goose. We went from basically no coyote market to uh, a lifetime highs in the coyote market, and almost kind of the same thing now with the with with beaver with the felt deal. Uh, it really kind of, you know, beaver was an item that was kind of struggling. And now that once it's like the hottest thing we got going. Uh, so <laughs> kind of struggling might be an understatement. 
Rogers? <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. Str- it was it was non-existent basically, <laughs> and yeah. then then it, it goes to a, a bit of a boom, and and so that's what I always kind of tell, like, like we got to sit back a little bit and think that you know regardless of any kind of marketing or anything for harvesters does the market ultimately is driven by people that have no idea where the fur even comes from. Um, you know, fashion is what drives us and it's not just in this country. It's all over the world. And I, I just get a kick out of like, so many times I hear people talk about like, especially trappers buy it, you know, American made, American made. And, and then, you know, China is where a lot of this fur goes. They are a big cog in the fur wheel. Not that I'm saying we need to go by, support China. That's not what I'm saying. But but it is interesting where we have to really look at at global markets and what's happening to kind of understand what might be driving the fur market. Because generally speaking, what's happening here in this country, outside of production, you know, the supply side. We have a big part in the supply side. We have very little in the demand. Yeah, side and and, of and one of the the sticky points there that you mentioned earlier was the speculators, and the speculators can make the market seem a little better than it is certain times. It can also flood the market other times. But I'm going to go out on a limb and speculate that most of the speculators have been burned so bad the past eight ten years that there's probably not a lot of speculation left in the market. So I, yeah, yep. if that, considering that's the case, we're probably dealing more with what, with the actual demand in the fur consuming countries. And what are your thoughts on, you know, we got the, the war in Russia, w- Russia and Ukraine. We've, we've got the, these EU countries that don't want to, are, are all trying to ban fur. And then we've got China whose economic uh, situation is, is questionable i don't think anybody really knows what's going on in china right now um what are, what are your thoughts do you have some insight in in where this demand is coming from well i i don't the one thing we do have to remember too is i think uh one of the things with coon and and you know trappers have the notion we need russia back in the market well a lot has changed in the way the fur industry works the way the world works with all kinds of things so like uh, Russia coming back in the market, I've been told by different people, hey, Russia never left the market. But Russian manufacturers learned that it was cheaper to have goods dressed and processed in China and then bring them into Russia. Also, there's Russian-made coats. You know, China can make a coat and put any kind of tag you want on it (laughs) to say where it's made or what it might be because none of that, those ethic ethical things that a lot of us value ultimately fly right through. Um, So, you know, you could have a, 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 a garment made in China and have your name as a Russian manufacturer, your name as an American manufacturer, whoever put right on it. And nobody really knows it's gone through there. And, you know, I think that's the case with, with so many different products. And that's maybe not to get tinfoil hat, but but I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but we, we know that kind of happens. Um, so with that being said, I feel China is is very, very much at, in some instances the the almost like like they are the market, which is very, very concerning when you look at the broad picture long term. Um, now, yeah, their we, their demographics are very terminal. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's not to say though that you don't have people in the fur industry, manufacturers that are innovating, finding new ways to do things um, that, you know, the next time we do have a big fashion trend, whether it be coyote trim coats or coonskin hats or who, who knows what it might be, that somebody in a different country doesn't create a method that's better, that's quicker, that's cheaper, that all at once maybe we see it be a little more diversified on the manufacturing end user garment portion of our trapping fur industry that 
that things could change and that would be really good um, because yeah. then we're not totally relying on one country's economy, communism and manipulation and labor costs and everything. You know, if it, if at some point it does become diversified, um, you know, it, it always can change. And, and, you know, to be able to predict or, or theorize on that, we don't really, it's all a big guess essentially um, <laughs> with, with the exception, I do think there's some people that are active that probably know a heck of a lot more than I do that could probably probably lay out how the next five or ten years might look. I am not that person. <laughs> so. Yeah. It, 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 the thing that troubles me a little bit is, is moving outside of China. Um, a lot of the countries that are set to boom like demographically and economically – are places like Africa where it's really hot and they don't wear a lot of fur. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, that concerns me. I don't know if the, if, you know, who knows there, there may be some, some real growth in some countries with colder weather that need fur, or maybe like you said, some, some fashion trends that, that uh, might create a little yeah. bit of demand for fur in places where they don't necessarily need it. That, that would be right. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we need to see a growth and, um, wealth increase in places like the Canadian, all the Canadian cities, Russia, Northern Europe, um, places that that are heavily, um, heavily, not heavily, places that have long cold winters. Those people need to have money to buy our product. <laughs> and, you know, if, like you say, if, if, if Africa, Latin America, South America, you know, a lot of the countries that that might see growth um, because of different industries, they're not in a climate that really that really makes for a necessity. However, I do believe the uber wealthy, regardless of where they work, where they live in the world, um, to to a segment of that of the uber wealthy, it's a status symbol to have a fancy coat for a coat. Um, so. That, I think, is something that's probably never really changed, other than maybe 50 years ago, a bigger percentage of those uber-wealthy valued fur as a status symbol, whereas now maybe they don't so much. Maybe now they buy more fancier cars or, or other things as a luxury versus fur as a luxury. I don't know how to quantify that, but it just seems that that there's it could be that. But then the other side of that argument is as we move into renewable energy and green and and people being concerned about the environment, you know, fur is a renewable resource. We make more of it every year. Um, and I think we could see a trend um, as we get more away from fossil fuels and if, if the world continues to move towards – green energy, renewable resources, things like that, that can only help us, I think, um, if, if, we, if, if we have the right people in place to, to speak on our behalf and explain the benefits of fur. But again, that's, we're really, that's something that's really a zoom out, big picture aspect of the fur market, not something that I don't think um, is going to change what happens now to next year or five years. That's something that I think we're talking more on a, on a generational, what the fur market looks 30 to 40 years from now relies more on those factors. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and, and of course, the one thing that you always stress when you come on here is the value of the U.S. dollar compared to these other nations. Well, yeah, and that's that's something that was the top thing when when I kind of made some notes when we were talking about getting together for this and and we talked last fall and and you said it perfectly. The highs every time we have a high in the fur market, it's still lower. Um when you look at inflation. And I feel like we need to currently just to get back to like the 2013 levels we need almost approximately double the prices and 10x the quantities to establish the market to where we were in 2013. So like Kuhn, for example, instead of 12,000, there'd need to be like 120,000 Kuhn 
and selling for twice as much to really just get back to where we were. Not advance any, just get back to where we were. And we still, we're still in a recovery, a long recovery. We had um, the NAFA collapse was a huge, huge, that was like the most catastrophic thing that could happen to us. And then that got followed up with the global cough through the cold and everything getting shut down. Um, so you have this double knockout punch to our industry that it's really presented a lot of challenges and if you look at just the past couple of years, like the prices at the grocery store, a price of a vehicle, prices of so many things, how high they have gotten. Yet here we are with fur, cheaper than we've been in quite in decades. <laughs> so yeah. it's it's just like like oh boy that that's not to be negative, but it's it it kind of makes you scratch your head like we're you know. How long does it take yeah. for all that stuff? To play I can't. Out? I can't see us ever getting back to there, but I, I hope I'm wrong. Now, one of the things that really interested me was the wild mink at this sale, and it's been a long time since we've seen wild mink prices like this. They were uh, more than double what they were the last auction. They averaged between eleven and sixteen dollars, which, again, historically that is dirt cheap, but that's very encouraging for for wild mink prices what do you think is going on here and is is this related directly to the ranch mink industry Mm, i i think it has to be almost everything i i feel like almost anything outside of the fox and the coyotes um most in the beaver but most almost all the other stuff is loosely related to ranch mink and what's available and what's happening with the ranch mink, which the ranch mink are extremely low. Um, demand is fairly low. Price is fairly low. However, apparently, you know, based on the sale, uh, the wild mink were a better alternative. Um, I don't think wild, wild mink, I don't think, are any there it's not like there's a different end user for wild mink than there are ranch mink um the average trapper um probably is not familiar with what a ranch mink looks like but a ranch mink is bigger better quality um you know uh, from a manufacturer's standpoint not there's a lot less of them now a few years ago though if you needed black mink a certain quality you could buy a million of them and they'd all look the same you know now you can't probably buy a million of them but you can buy 50,000 of them or 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 a a huge compared to wild mink a huge quantity that are all the same uniformity so from a manufacturing process it's going to speed you up everything's going to look the same they're going to be the same grade there's not going to be any blemishes imperfections uh they're going to be matched it's going to streamline your operation Wild mink, there's a lot of variants. However, um, and with wild mink, you're basically, you've got one color of wild mink. There's some different, you got dark and light, but not like ranch mink where you have uh, umpteen different color variations from essentially white to black and a rainbow of colors and patterns in between. Um, but apparently, I I don't have a lot of insight on it, but just looking at the sale, um there was some demand there. And I think that was one of the, probably the bigger surprises at the sale was that they actually got a move for a price that was a lot better than where we were a year ago. So I think that's really encouraging. Yeah. It's, it's kind of surprising to me that they moved up, but the muskrat didn't move. And, and I know like you, you know, they, they usually say muskrat is a, I don't know, a, a replacement for the, the, better ranch mink if, if prices get really yeah. high maybe that's just so lagging I, yeah i and, the, and i think some some of that comes back to if you look at the fee i don't know what the fee is the buyer's fee is on the mink but let's say it's a dollar 25 and you buy a male mink for 15 bucks you pay a dollar 25 that's under five or under 10 percent it's not a drastic um a drastic difference versus a three dollar muskrat that you need to now pay four and a quarter for when you could buy that same three dollar muskrat in the country uh for three dollars 
where's the wild mink if they're really wanting wild mink there's probably not as many wild mink available in the country as an alternative whereas muskrats there probably is to where a buyer doesn't need to go there and and overpay for a muskrat whereas maybe the wild mink maybe they feel like i need to have them so i'm going to to be a little more aggressive bidding on them yeah i, I would That's, assume again, that speculation of my would be a really good outlet for muskrat buyers Yes, and, and, and something we've got to remember, too, like Grimwald's is a huge operation, and, you know, they, they offer skins dressed in China. I, I Maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but um, no, I, think I haven't directly. No, I think he's mentioned that on yeah, YouTube before. I, yeah, I, and, and so I, I, if you're a manufacturer in China and you have the ability to go to them and say, I need 1,000 skins, um, of mus- I need a thousand muskrats. I need a thousand coon, and you can get them in your own country already dressed. That's a huge convenience, and you can buy a hundred skins, let's say, and you can go manufacture your hats, sell them, and then when you get your next order, you can go back and buy another hundred skins and process your next order. Um, the one thing I feel a China in China, especially um, people that are are making for a, a smaller manufacturer in China. They are very smart business people as a whole, so they are ma- managing their cash flow. They're not going to take on debt. Um, they probably can't get debt in their country right. like we can here. Yeah. So they're going to be forced into buying 100 skins here. Maybe they buy 1,000. They manufacture them, sell them. They take their profits, and they buy for their next order when they get it. That buyer cannot fly halfway around the world and go to fur harvesters and buy what they need two times a year. It does not work for their business. It can't work because they're, they're, there's, they do not have the means to do that. It takes too much time. And then there's no guarantee on what they're going to have to pay when they get there. Um, so, you know, that probably eliminates a lot of, and again, I'm not knocking fur harvesters. It's just, just some perspective on, on what the end user that, takes our skin it a, a little bit of perspective on how they might be looking at their business um so there is a huge advantage there for grunwald's getting getting that skin dressed into that country where that buyer can then come and buy weekly or monthly or every three days if they want you know as they need yeah, it and they yeah. know what the price is going to be no that makes um, a lot of whereas, sense whereas so it, look at it, it, like Go ahead. It, in in their harvest report, they mentioned that those wild mink were primarily bought by Italians, and I would mm-hmm. imagine that the Italians were there bidding on bobcats, high end pelts that they can't get anywhere else. And right, so it would be natural that they would buy the wild mink that were there at the time. Um, yeah, and, and and it's almost like a secondary reason to go there, which it makes sense for them to do that. They're there already. There's not any extra cost for them travel-wise, overhead-wise, and getting there to go ahead and say, hey, we can use that mink. And, and maybe it's a one-off deal. Maybe the next sale won't be as strong on the wild mink. Hopefully I'm wrong about that. But it, I think you're absolutely right that it could be, you know, the bobcats did well. You can't go anywhere else and buy bobcats outside of fur harvesters or other country dealers, mostly in the western like part George of the Corbin, U.S. Maybe. Like yeah, so so you have, um, they have to come to North America to get cats, basically. Speaking of cats, but, that, was, that was a really good sale. Yeah, mm-hmm, yep, yep. And, and again, the bobcat market is something a lot of people get somewhat excited about, but it's it's tough because it doesn't really drive our trapping industry. You only have a few states and a few places where those high dollar cats exist, and where they do exist, there's a limited amount of people really producing them. Um, so when you look at it overall, it's great that they did good, but it's not something that totally like drives interest into trapping. Um, it's not like like when coon you can catch in almost every single state in the union. They're easy to catch. A high dollar bobcat is only available in select 
places that are hard to get to, require a lot of work, and require skill and knowledge to produce. So yeah. it's great yeah. that they did good, but you know, like as a supply dealer, the bobcat market being extremely high for Western cats doesn't equate to as much um, spent on bobcat equipment as it does like somebody here in Illinois drawing their bobcat tag for the first time. Right. That person that, or some of the other states that, that it's still a bit of a de- big deal to draw a bobcat tag and be able to catch one. You know, that person that's able to catch one for the first time in their life is willing to spend $1,000 in equipment and different items to go produce that bobcat. The guy in Montana that is an experienced bobcat trapper, he has everything he needs to continue to produce high-dollar cats. So whether the cat's bringing 200 or 2000 in Montana, it doesn't really equate to any more money getting spent in the industry on bobcat equipment. <laughs> that's that's, a, so that's an interesting point. That would make a, a pretty cool topic for future uh, podcasts. It would be like, you know, how these different species impact the overall fur market and it, for indus- trapping industry yeah. as a whole. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it's really interesting, like, like, for you, Fisher and Martin is a is a big deal, and they did well at the sale. Yeah. But they are essentially irrelevant to ninety nine percent of the trappers yeah. um, because they're just only existent in certain places, and they're not an easy animal to trap. Like anybody can set a dog proof trap and immediately become a raccoon trapper. You can't immediately go out and start producing Martin in deep snow country in Montana or northern Maine without an investment of equipment and knowledge. And it's also one of them things like people are not going to go seek out a place to go trap Martin necessarily. So it leaves it to the northern Northwood states of the lower 48 Canada and Alaska. And again, it's, it's similar to the Bobcats. Um, You might notice a few more like one twenties or certain traps (laughs) getting sold when the Martin fisher market booms. But ultimately, the people that are in those regions, they have all the equipment already. When Martin are $20 or they're $50, they're still trapping them the same way. (laughs) So it's not like coon or or beaver or even coyotes where it's people that are taking time off work to go produce them, and they will do it at a certain price level and not do it at another price level. The people that are catching high, high mountain bobcats or Northwoods Martin Fisher, they're doing it consistently year in and year out, I think, because that's what they love to do. Uh, so it's totally different. Um, the production is totally different because I think it's more of a passion. Not that it's more of a passion, but it's a different level of trapping than catching raccoons in a cornfield. Well, what really hit home to me, it was the first time we discussed this. I I I wasn't fully bought into that idea because it didn't it didn't make as much sense to me that that would have such a, a huge impact on the overall fur market. And then I looked at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, trapping surveys they do like every five years. And when you look at the number of trappers in each region of the country, I was blown away at the number of trappers in the Midwest relative to everywhere else in the United States. And, Absolutely. And, and that coon belt that you mentioned, that is where the vast majority of our trappers are. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's when, when it, it's one of the things that um, it's a different era, era now, but pre-internet, like 97, 98, 99 into the early two thousands, I went to conventions across the country and, the sheer volume of people when you get outside of like Minnesota to Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa. um, When you get outside of that, there's a lot of trappers in Pennsylvania and New York too. But once you get outside of those core States, you see a significant fall off. And then as I trap different places, like you go to the South, like Mississippi, there's trappers in Mississippi, but I mean, you can't, after you're there, like you go down to Mississippi, you start trapping. It's like, man, I can get permit. You know, so many landowners, catfish farmers, timber people want you to come trap. After two or three years of going to the same place, it's almost overwhelming to think about 
how many people want you to trap on their ground. Yeah. Whereas then you come back here where I live, and if we drove around this county, even now I would say 80% of the farmers would say, oh, so-and-so comes to traps here, yeah. even now. Yeah. So you get this, it's, a, it's, it's such a different, um, it's so different, and it's, it's really hard to, to explain or quantify, but when you look at those numbers of where trappers are, it is, it is very, very uh, heavy in certain regions, and that's a big reason why trapping interests hinges so much on the raccoon because that's the primary animal in that primary region that is easy to produce. Um, you can catch a lot of them without putting, getting in the water, getting on a snowmobile or driving two track roads up into the mountains. You, know, you can, it, it's, it's just not that it's easy, but it's, it's more appealing than it is, to do a, to produce a lot of the other animals in a lot harsher conditions. <clears throat> yeah, and you are right in the heart of it, where where you're located and set up. So you you can feel that changing, I'm sure, from year to year as the market changes. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And and so the one thing that that is different now is like in '07 when I when I first moved here to where we're at. Um, there were so many high school kids that would stop and buy stuff from us. And we're, again, we're talking going into like 07 to 13, 14 coon market was strong. It was like a parade of people. I mean, we would have days, seven, eight people stop and, and it was really busy this past fall. Um, I actually can't even tell you the name of the last high school kid we had stop here and buy supplies. It's been that long ago. Wow. Um, yeah, you know, it's just it's it's changed a lot, and, and a lot of that I think is is the money aspect of it. Um, you know, if a raccoon is worth eight dollars stretched and dried, what sixteen or seventeen year old kid can really afford to put gas in their vehicle and run around here and catch them? In two thousand thirteen, you could take a carcass coon over to Grenwalds and get twenty five dollars for it, regular, regular, and so. It's really a, it's that plays a big factor in it, and and I know a lot of us are passionate about trapping, and we say we don't trap for the money, and I believe that's true for a lot of us. But I also believe it's evident in the numbers that we're lying to ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the financial aspect of trapping, unfortunately, plays a huge role in interest and and how much we want to do it well i can tell you my, pers my personal level of trapping is directly related to how much money i can afford to lose yeah yeah and, and and it's funny that that with say deer hunting or duck hunting or playing golf nobody seems to really analyze that aspect of it <laughs> but trapping the one item where you can get more than zero dollars back we really are tuned in on what that number might be um I bow, I hunted deer more than I ever have in my whole life these past three years, and I have made zero dollars doing it. But I looked more forward to that this past fall than I did to trapping season. And maybe for me personally, it's a it's a means of reliving memories that I have from being a kid. My grandpa passed away a few years ago, and and it's something that he was passionate about. So we find those more uh, uh, family, it's part of our heritage, um, and if it's raining, I don't have to go deer hunting that day. If I'm busy here, we got semis coming and going, I got a lot to do, I don't have to go deer hunting yep. that day. You're not committed. If I set traps, I got to do it every <laughs> single day, no matter what the day looks like, and I think a lot of us are, you know, I'm in a different situation now. My family is more important to me than than catching a greasy raccoon. So I do analyze, like, like I have people ask, like, D you know, when was the last time you trapped Iowa? I don't have an interest in being gone all day running raccoon traps, especially in today's market. I want to, I don't want to miss out on things with my girls, with my family. You know, that's a, I try to 
I try to remember that, you know, our kids are only kids for a short amount of time of our lives, really. And I want to make sure that that's a priority while they are kids, because one day they're going to be adults and then I can go to, I can go back to doing the things that I did when I was younger, whether it be trapping coon or, or, you know, going to conventions far away. Um, maybe then I'll get back to that. But right now it's so far down the priority list. And yeah. I know a lot of customers I talk to are in the exact same boat. Um, you know, those high school kids that were coming and buying stuff from us in 2013, <laughs> they're 30 years old. They're 30 years old now. So they're, I'm a little bit old. I mean, I, my wife and I had kids later in life um, compared to a lot, but a lot of guys that were coming out of high school into that 07, 08, 09 market, they're now in their young thirties and have kids and they're looking at it the same way I am um, to where they're not interested in trying to catch hundreds of animals. Even if the coon market, if, if coon bought $50 tomorrow, they're still not going to be interested yeah. because it's not worth, the time away from what they value most. And I, I think that plays into, into trapper interest and production. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So what else do you have on your list? Well, we covered everything on my list except the one last thing. And, and it kind of goes back to, to fur harvesters and, and, you know, analyzing the sale. Again, I don't mean to be critical of fur harvesters in any way. I think their sale went very well. Um, I'm happy with with how they handled it, getting the results out. I think they did an excellent job. I mean, I feel like I'm impressed more so with this sale than I've been in a long time with fur harvesters. But going back to the the buyer's perspective and that example of cash flow for the for a manufacturer in China and being able to buy regular um, fur harvesters is only two sales a year, and so to put that in perspective, like. What would you do if you could only buy feed for your beef two times a year? <laughs> I've never thought about it that way. I would you know, make sure I, I have everything that I'm going to need. And then the other aspect is, can you really afford to do that? Do you, does that like it depends on what interest uh, rates are looking like? Yeah, yeah, it forces you to borrow. And I, and I think, you know, when we're talking about a market that's driven by people in China who probably have very little access to debt, and if they do, they don't want to borrow the money, they need to buy a lot more than two times a year. And that's, again, no fault of fur harvesters. I'm not blaming fur harvesters. But I think when we look at the fur market, what's happened to NAFA and, and Copenhagen the auction motto is probably not servicing the manufacturers now like they need it to. Not at, these, yeah, why, not at these levels of fur. When we used to have auctions yeah. like September, December, January, February, sometimes, you know, you'd have three, four auctions for each fur house, you know, back you know, yeah. 15 years ago. That that made more yeah, sense and, as far as cash flow and purchasing time. Right, right, and and I mean they still had travel, but you you could go and buy enough quantity that would offset some of the travel. Whereas now, I don't know that demand is such that it, well, and production is so low that even if there was demand, we don't have hundreds of thousands of raccoon. We don't have outside of the muskrats that are sitting there at a high valuation. We don't have the volume. So it's it's really a lot of stuff needs to get sorted out, I think, before we see a a very, very large increase in both demand and production. Uh, so it's it's inter it's interesting to look at and it'll be real interesting to see, you know, what happens in May and, and where we go from here. Um it's definitely I know I always say I think long term you know, the fur market is not going anywhere. We're one of the oldest industries in the world. Um, we're, I, I don't think it's something that's going away completely anytime soon. But I also feel like it's going to look a lot different as we move ahead because the world has changed and the way we do business has changed. Uh, so to look back and say, 
wow, this is how, you know, we need this or we need that. We don't know what we need exactly yet. The market will determine that later. Um, is it going to be, is the market going to be determined at auction? I don't think so. I think that is something that has changed and that is, is you know, maybe it'll come back around. But where we sit now, I feel like if you look across the board on fur harvesters, a lot of the items that, that, when I look at them, and I caught a handful of coon, um, I sold my coon right here to Grenwalds and got more than I would have if I had shipped them. And so that's something that, um, you know, there's a lot of larger country buyers that are probably able to be more aggressive because they are able to offer a dressed, finished product when it's needed instead of just at the two auctions. And now, you know, maybe fur harvesters will get into more private treaty or, or do some different things to to make some changes. And who knows, maybe we don't need any changes. Maybe it's, it's not, maybe I'm dead wrong too. I can admit that. But it just seems evidence, evident by what's happened here the past few years that the auction motto is a little bit broken for the fur market. Yeah, that that's a really interesting way of, of looking at things and how, how the market is changing or maybe needs to change. I see a lot of parallels with the beef cattle industry and uh, you know, traditionally everything was brought into the sh- stockyards and places like, like where you, like Chicago and, and Kansas mm-hmm. city. And uh, then things transition towards uh, our, primarily towards sale barns and little country sale barns where people bring their cattle. Um, and now the market is starting to transition away from a little bit away from the sale barn model and into more of a vertically integrated model where buyers are the big four packing plants. And what a lot of the people who are kind of pushing to maintain the traditional sale barn auction model are there are arguing is that as you get higher up into vertical integration, you cut down on the competition between buyers And then all of a sudden, the true, you know, that true market price that was established at auction is suddenly only based on a few people that might get together on a golf course and talk about how what they're going to pay this week. And uh, and it it can break down. It can break down the industry. I know a a lot of people in the pork industry were pretty upset um, when when vertical integration took place there because it put a lot of small pork producers out of business and the only people that were left were people who had really large hog barns with, you know, 5,000 head uh, barns. Yeah. And, uh, and and I can see that market in the beef cattle industry starting to change. And I can see the resistance there, and I can see a parallel with the fur market and fur industry. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's interesting. A lot of, a lot of markets, I look back to, to, it was in 2000, the first year I was in Mississippi, I trapped on a, on, for a landowner that was a huge catfish producer. And he sold his catfish. He owned part of the processing plant. His catfish went to places like Long John Silver's and, and you know, uh, fast food restaurants, a big, huge producer of catfish. And I remember one day I stopped there to get a key for a gate or something, and he was on the phone call, and he kind of just motioned me. And I, I sat down there in his office while he finished the phone call. And whoever he was talking to, he said, um, he said, well, you know, he said that very, very large operations like us are doing fine. And he said the, the, uh, the guy that just wants to raise one pond of catfish because he finds it fun he's fine but he said everybody else in between can't make no money anymore and it's i think that's the case um you know I, at the time i didn't understand what he was really saying because i was like it, it, it didn't mean anything i had no idea what he's really talking about i just wanted to get the key to the gate so I could go <laughs> make some art. but for whatever reason i listened to it and it always sat with me because it was kind of fascinating to me like i i've always for me personally as i get older i realize what I'm drawing to most about anything is business. Um, and I love to trap, but I ultimately think when I look back on it, I was more drawn and more motivated to trap because I was trying to market myself 
in business and sell lures. Right. Um, so I've, I've really been drawn to business. So I hear thing, people say that, and it was something about catfish. It wasn't anything to do with me, but it stuck in my head. And then fast forward, and, and like what you're saying about, I could make that same statement about dairy farming right here in this area. Yeah. And I think, I think sometimes, um, like you said in, in beef, that vertical integration stuff, it's very real, and it, it the story is slightly different with the industry, but the end result is the same. Things change, and I think that's where we're at in the fur market, too. And when we look at the people buying the fur in this country, the NAFA bankruptcy changed it. So uh, looking back 15 years ago, we had tons of small fur buyers that probably bought – one to 5,000 coon. They sold some supplies out of their garage. They shipped that stuff to NAFA. They made money. It was, it was great for getting people involved with trapping because throughout the Midwest, every couple counties in a couple county radius, you had a guy like that, that you could go and buy some traps and dump your coon off to get some cash and you were in business. So it was great for high school kids. It was great for grandpa wanting to take the kids trapping for a weekend. It was convenient. All of that is gone now. Yes. Um, the fur buyers that are left are are large, Grenwald, WebKey, the names that advertise in the magazines that everybody knows. And it's harder for them to do business too now. Mm -hmm. um, we no longer have NAFA. Um, so it's it's just... It's a huge, huge change, and it's really hard to know what it's going to look like in another five years. Is it going to get back to the way it was? Possibly, but I really don't think so, um, because the path to success is much harder than it was in 2007, 2008, when you could buy a coon, skin it, flesh it, stretch it, ship it to NAFA, and make $20 on that raccoon and sell that person $100 worth of traps and supplies every time they stop. It's simply not like that anymore. Um, so that takes that, that picture and basically erases it from where we're at now. And that, that is, it's really sad ultimately, but it's also, it's just part of how, markets and things change and i don't know that it's anything that we have to try to fix or fight it's something we have to accept and innovation is the process of of a new set of eyes coming in and seeing it differently and capitalizing on it and that's what will drive the next wave of new trappers the next fur boom the next rise in anything is is new sets of eyes at some point come in, see things differently, innovate, uh, uh, and, and it's a it's a process. And I I guess I I'm kind of open minded to it. I want to see what it looks like because that is more exciting and more motivating to me to just see what it looks like than to look backwards more or less. Um, but it's it's also sometimes trying on the patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good mindset though. Either change or get left behind. And and I've always been I've always looked a little side eyed at the people that are, are try to fight things. We need to stop this and we need to fix this. And and uh, really giving ourselves way too much credit to think we can actually change this this big wave um, uh, of of market yeah. changes. So uh, I'm hoping that in five years you and me will still be around and we'll be able to talk about how things have changed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm committed. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here. I, I, you know, I, I'm not I'm too young to retire. And, and when I am old, I don't know why I would want to retire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, what am I gonna do then? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right on, well, Kyle. This is fun as always. Thanks so much for being on. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always fun to fun to visit. Like oh. I say, every time we could probably sit here till we both had sore throats and and keep talking and <laughs> analyzing. <laughs> Any, anything anything you want folks to know about Cotts Brothers Lures to to pay attention to or or to look for? Um, you can. I would tell people they can get on our website and sign up for our newsletter. We're getting close to the time of year where I I kind of focus on sending out newsletters. I know we're going to have some 
some sales and some items that we're going to kind of force to close out so you'd be able to get a good deal on. Um, I know I don't want to speak out of turn because I don't know when it's going to happen, but we we do have one new product that I think some people will be excited when it when it comes out, but we're we're just working on trying to get other things done first before we can get get that item ready to go. But if you keep an eye on the newsletter, uh, I will definitely definitely be sending some some of that some sales and and one new item for sure coming down the line. But like I say, it might be a little later this spring yet before we get caught up enough to to get that get everything squared away to where I have the time to to get back to weekly newsletters and website updates. Right on. Sounds good. Thanks, Kyle. Yep. Thanks, Jeremiah.